Good morning, everyone. Thank you for our back to school news conference. We are excited to be able to host it in this beautiful building. I'd like to introduce the panel before we get started. So we have our superintendent, Dr. Hill, Dr. Crystal Hill. We also have Dr. Melissa Balknight, our deputy superintendent. And with us, we have uh, Nancy uh, Blackwell, I'm sorry, Blackwell, right? Brightwell, Brightwell, <laughs> I'm marrying the two. Um, Brightwell, who is our chief of retention, re recruitment, retention, and talent development. And then we have our um, chief operations officer, Tim Ivey. And then we also have our chief of strategy and innovation officer, Beth Thompson. And my name is Shauna Spickard, and I am kind of new, so that's why I'm learning everybody's <laughs> names. And so I am the chief communications officer. I'm very excited to be here. Before we get started with the panel, we do want to thank our host here today of this beautiful school. And so Summer Rogers has agreed to give us a little bit of information about Knights View Elementary before we pass it on to Dr. Hill to get started. Thank you so much, Shauna. Again, thank you for being here at Knights View Elementary School. I am the proud principal, Summer Rogers, and I am honored to be able, able to open this brand new state-of-the-art building. I have been in education and CMS for 25 years, my whole career, and I am proud to be a part of CMS. I have served in various roles and worked at several schools, but let me tell you, being chosen to open a brand new building, there's nothing else like it. This building is possible because of the 2017 bond referendum and we are helping to bring relief to surrounding elementary schools. As you all can imagine, so much has happened since we broke ground, and that activity has been non-stop here at Knights View. Our team has taken part in professional development, setting up classrooms, and celebrating the opening of a brand new school with a royal feast yesterday, all with the intent of establishing Knights View as an amazing school focused on creating a positive school culture, fostering academic success, and promoting student and staff leadership. We can't wait to welcome our 525 students and families next week with pre-kindergarten uh, pre through fourth grade and engage them in high levels of learning and teaching each and every day because that is the KVES way. And now I would like to turn it over to the Honorable Superintendent, Dr. Crystal Hill. Is my mic on? It is on, all right. Thank you so much, Summer, and we're so excited to have you um, leading this beautiful school. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, at this time, I'm really excited to have our Board of Education members that are with us today. Uh, Lisa Klein, if you'd want to give a wave, thank you. We have Summer Nunn, we have Lenora Sanders Ship, and we have Dr. Monty Witherspoon. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We are so excited and eager to kick off the 2024-25 school year, and we're very excited to welcome you to the brand new Knights View Elementary School, which is one of two brand new schools that are opening this year, and of course we have another replacement school that we are opening. We invite you to stay here in the building for a beautiful tour once we've concluded our briefing. We definitely appreciate your help in helping us spread the word to our families and to the public about our preparations for this new school year. Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools is continuing its focus on excellence without exception for students and for our staff. We are committed to ensuring endless possibilities for our students by creating supportive, inclusive learning environments that foster creativity, critical thinking, and personal growth. We will continue to provide students access to a myriad of educational resources, opportunities for exploration and discovery, and personalized learning experiences. We will also continue to encourage our students to always strive for improvement, take risk, and learn from their setbacks and their failures. We can all learn from that, right? 
We know when students pursue their passions and interests, they will unlock their full potential and open up a world of endless possibilities for their futures. Today, we will provide you with updates about the district's new organizational structure, operations including electric buses and new schools, staffing and teacher recruitment, partnerships, and our strategic plan. Before we get to those updates, I would like to take a few minutes to share some important reminders with our parents, guardians, and caregivers who may be watching. Please make sure you've completed the form to opt your students in for very important health and dental screenings that our school health department offers. We want to make sure that you are receiving communication from the district and from your school. So please make sure that you download the Parent Square app to stay connected. All official district and school communication will be sent through Parent Square. Once you've set up your profile, you can set notification preferences for your preferred language and how often you would like to receive notifications, either in real time or a compiled in a digest. And lastly, before I turn it over to Dr. Balknight, I want to remind our parents to visit our back to school website for information about open houses, transportation, health screenings, parent square, and much, much more. You can access the site from the main page of our district website or by typing in the URL www.cmsk12.org backslash back to school into your browser. Once again, thank you for joining us today, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Balknight, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools Deputy Superintendent. Good morning. Welcome back to school to our students, families, and staff. We've been very busy this summer. Over the summer and last year, we have continued to organize for endless possibilities. We have restructured 11 school performance areas to support our schools by elementary, middle, high, and K-8. Our district leadership collaborated to strategically build performance areas with a focus on, focus on balance and equity to ensure schools receive individualized supports unique to each school level. Every performance area has a team of instructional specialists, an assistant superintendent, and an executive director to support our schools. We have been very intentional in designing our day-to-day -day work to prioritize instruction and hands-on time in schools. We will continue to focus on data-driven decision making and school improvement aligned to our district strategic plan. In addition, we have provided new resources for our schools this year. We have worked collaboratively all summer to develop those resources to support students, teachers, and families. Our teams led professional learning experiences throughout the summer. At the start of the summer, district and professional school leaders gathered to hear the charge from our superintendent and to receive the rollout of the 24-25 school year initiatives to set the foundation for a great year. More than 60 school teams attended an immersive two-day session with Capturing Kids Hearts, which supports our social emotional learning for our students and teachers. Our teachers have also had an opportunity to launch into the new school year with several professional development sessions. We will continue to support our teachers with our K-5 mathematics and instructional training to make sure that we delve into grade level standards and meet the needs of our students. Language arts training has occurred throughout the summer as well to support our curriculum to literacy research and the science of reading. Secondary math, language arts, and science topics included unit overviews, the emphasis on productive talks and strategies, and the preparation for teaching the new science standards. Those targeted learning opportunities are expected to equip our educators to meet the needs of our students. Our staff, was, they weren't the only ones that were busy this summer. Many of our students attended summer camp. In fact, we had 17,000 students participate in our summer experience over eight weeks. Our programs included Read to Achieve to support and refine literacy skills, as well as Freshman Connection. And lastly, our comprehensive review. We continue to work on phase one of our comprehensive review this summer. The purpose of the review is to thoroughly evaluate and enhance the effectiveness of the district's educational programs, operations, and policies. This review aims to assess current practices, identify areas for improvement, and ensure that resources are being utilized efficiently to meet the needs of students, families, and the community. Lastly, as we support our students as we've talked about this morning, we will have learner profiles that we'll utilize with our students next fall or this fall. 
Most importantly, our students will learn more about themselves as learners and how they learn best and what they are interested in throughout their educational journey. Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools puts the student at the center of their learning to provide excellence in their experiences. This ensures that each student has a trusted adult, a rigorous experience, and is post-secondary ready. At this time, I would like to introduce Tim Ivey, our Chief Operations Officer. Mr. Ivey. Good morning. We're excited to begin the 24-25 school year with a focus on operational efficiency and safe, clean environments. With capital projects this year, we want to say thanks to the 2017 bond approved by the Mecklenburg County voters. We are going to be introducing three new schools to the CMS family. Bruns Avenue Elementary, Knightsview Elementary, where we are today, and Valentine Ridge High School. Just over a dozen projects are also underway as part of phase one of the 2023 bond projects. In facilities and, con and grounds, building services team has worked hard over the summer to ensure facilities are ready for students and staff on August 26th. Custodial services completed summer cleaning at all schools, including floor, floor stripping and waxing, surface and restroom cleaning, and movement of teacher supplies. Maintenance and engineering department repaired HVAC units, paved parking lots, painted interiors, and completed various flooring and carpeting projects. In transportation, please note we have over, we have 104,000 students that are assigned to transportation with 839 buses expected to be on the road on the first day of school. A record of 90,000 intent to ride surveys have been completed. Um, <clears throat> we also want to ride, remind parents to download the Here Comes the Bus app and use the Alpha portal via cmsk12.org backslash buses. Please be at the bus stop 10 minutes before your scheduled time and also note that CMS will receive 55 buses through the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Clean School Bus Grant Program by the end of 25-26 school year with three electric buses in service on the first day of school. Express stops will return this year to enhance access, reduce ride times, and improve on-time arrival to high school and some middle school magnet programs. For more information on transportation, we ask that you visit the CMS website under the Transportation Department. I also want to remind all commuters on Monday to please be patient and alert. We are going to be introducing 104, 141 plus thousand students back into the traffic pattern in one way or the other, and we'd ask that you please uh, be patient and alert and look out. School nutrition updates. This year we are proud to announce we will be providing free breakfast for all CMS students with meal prices remaining unchanged. Students at 115 community eligibility, eligibility provision schools or CEP schools will receive all meals at no cost. The list of CEP schools is available under School Nutrition Services and on the district site. Students attending non-CEP schools will need to complete a meal application to be considered for free or reduced lunch price benefits. Online applications are available online now and on the CMS internet. And in safety, safety is our top priority. All visitors must check in using our Lobby Guard Visitor Management System, which is actively monitored in all schools. Students entering K-8, middle, and high schools will go through our walk-through security scanners. And Mecklenburg County Office of Violence and Prevention has partnered with CMS to install clean graffiti stencils at over 20 schools promoting violence prevention. These, school, these stencils are in both English and Spanish, and Spanish and will be visible for three to six months at 25 middle and high schools. At this time, I'd like to introduce Nancy Brightwell, Chief Recruitment, Retention, and Tal Talent Development Officer. Good morning. We have a bold vision for attracting, recruiting, and retaining exceptional talent as a foundation to advancing student success here in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. We're pleased to be welcoming 663 new teachers to our district this year and have a total of 17,626 employees who comprise our crown asset in CMS, our caring and dedicated staff. This spring and summer, we've launched several strategic initiatives aimed at bolstering our recruitment and retention efforts in CMS, 
ensuring that we continue to bring top-notch educators who will inspire and empower our amazing students to reach their full potential. One of these initiatives was to offer all teachers new to CMS a deeper onboarding experience to enhance their classroom readiness. Over 750 teachers attended this first ever Crown Academy over the past several weeks. We have truly hit the jackpot with the teachers who have chosen CMS and we thank them for their commitment to our students and our families in Mecklenburg County. We've held 12 local in-person career fairs as well as a large virtual fair and continue to conduct numerous targeted marketing campaigns to support hiring for all of our schools and departments with staff needs. Our CMS Teacher Residency Program, which is our own district-sponsored educator preparation program, continues to be a wonderful pipeline for our teacher vacancies. The program is set to support its largest cohort ever with 204 teacher residents for the 24-25 school year, all of whom have been hired into teaching positions and will be closely supported as they work toward becoming fully credentialed teachers. These strategies, along with others, have led us to currently having 97% of our teaching positions filled. We have 293 teacher vacancies. That would be 262 if you excluded the teacher leader pathway positions, which are outside of classroom teaching positions, but are still considered classroom teaching positions. Our highest need areas are exceptional children's, expanded impact teachers, which are teacher leader pathway positions, and elementary. As we prepare to welcome students back, school leaders have worked closely with their human resource partners and their school performance area superintendents to establish strong plans to ensure that all classrooms are prepared for strong instruction. Our teachers and staff are ready and welcome to receive our students back this, this summer. I'd now like to introduce Beth Thompson, our Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer. Good morning. This school year, we start our work to achieve new goals and guardrails, and we have a road to success. Our work is organized around four pillars of excellence. While the academic pillar is most closely aligned with our goals, the other three pillars, people, operational, and engagement, are critical to the achievement of our goals. Available now on the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools website is our 24-29 five-year strategic plan and our one-year 24-25 district annual plan. While the goals share what we will be doing, the annual plan shares how we will be achieving those goals during this school year and beyond. Our district departments have outlined their year one, this year actions, in their 24-25 department plans. They are finalizing their targets for this year, and those will be on the Charlotte Mecklenburg websites once complete alongside our school improvement plans. Speaking of school improvement plans, schools are currently in the process of finalizing their 24-25 annual plans as well. Those will also be posted on the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools website. Then throughout the year, we'll be monitoring our progress on those plans to be sure we're doing the things we said we were gonna do with effectiveness and with impact. Our ongoing student outcomes focused governance monitoring reports will be located on that webpage every time they're presented to the Board of Education. This webpage serves as a one-stop shop to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and the progress we're making along the way. We're proud of the countless ways Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, in partnership with the community, will continue the journey of excellence this year. And we ask each and every member of our community to join in this life-changing life work by signing up to partner with us. I have cards here, and you won't leave without one that gives you all the information you need to sign up to volunteer, and for families to engage within our district. We're making it as easy as possible to get involved. And we're specifically in need of 250 volunteers to tutor kindergarten, first, and second grade students in buildings just like this one we're in today. There are options for tutors to work with students virtually or in person. All you need is one hour a week, and a willing and committed spirit will teach you the rest, we promise. Sign up today 
And with that, we officially welcome you back to the 2024-25 school year. We're looking forward to a fantastic year because endless possibilities start with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And I'll now turn it back over to Dr. Hill for closing comments. Thank you so much, Beth and team, for all of those updates. So there you have it. A great deal of work has gone into preparing for the 2024-25 school year, and we cannot wait to get started next week. We know we've provided you all with a lot of information today. So at this time, we'd like to open it up to entertain any questions that you may have. And our Executive Director of Media Relations, Susan Vernon Devlin, will moderate this portion of our briefing. Susan. <laughs> Just called you out, Brett. I know, right? <laughs> it's not the first time someone from CMS has called me out. Uh, speaking of which, Dr. Hill, so about a week ago, you met with a handful of media outlets yep. uh, to about an embargo before this thing. You chose the four, but you left and excluded certain media members out. Us, the Shaw Observer, because you didn't like something that the Shaw Observer wrote about saying that you had no comment concerning stipends, and so you excluded them. Do you think that's, when you're trying to get out the information that you're trying to get out, do you think it's wise to exclude certain media outlets when you handpick either cooperative or friendly media outlets as opposed to all media outlets? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Um, it's inaccurate in the way that you described it. So let in me which just, way? let me provide some clarity as, as I will. Um, I made the decision to invite trusted media partners who have in the past reported um, what, I would, would, what I would say is accurate information. So it wasn't that I picked and choose people that say things that are negative or positive. I mean, the people that were selective had, have said things that in my opinion would be negative. So it's not necessarily that I like or don't like what people say, but I've selected people that are rooted in making sure that they accurately report. The other thing that I use that as an opportunity is they peppered us with questions and I felt like that was a great opportunity to prepare as we presented to the Board of Education um, so we'd be prepared to provide clear and accurate information to the public. For example, they asked some questions like, well on this slide you said this, but on that side you said this. That doesn't really make sense. So we use that as an opportunity to go back and fix some things so it would be more accurate and clear to the public. Um, we actually got that idea when we um, actually released our budget. So when we released our budget for the first time, my budget recommendation to the board, um, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of questions that we received from media the following day. So the board meeting is Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, we received a lot of questions. Wednesday morning is our cabinet day. So we received lots of questions, didn't have an opportunity to answer those questions. And so we came back and we, I asked you know, some of our media partners, what can we do to help better provide clarity when we're speaking? And one of the suggestions they gave is, if you have an embargoed media opportunity, it allows us to ask you the questions, so then that way you can um, share the information more accurately, and there's not as many questions. And I think that did work. So this time when we gave um, the comprehensive review on Tuesday night, which is very complex. We did not receive as many inquiries because they helped prepare us to make sure that when we, when we provided the information that it was clear to the public. But it was in no way selecting people that are quote friendly because some of the people that we invited aren't necessarily what you would refer to as friendly. But you said, but you, but you did say, she went, but, but she said that inaccurate information. So what have I ever reported that's been inaccurate? I'll be happy to talk with you about that I would offline. love to hear that, because I haven't reported on you in eight months. with the HR stuff. Could you give us some context for the teacher vacancies, how that compares with this time last year? Uh, same with bus driver, how many vacancies do you have and how does that compare? And specifically West Charlotte High School, I'm hearing some consternation that they got a new principal very close to the start of the school year and apparently without the normal 
community engagement process of saying, what are you looking for? What do we want in this? Um, why did that play out in that particular way? So teacher context, bus driver vacancies, and West Charlotte. Yes, thank you uh, for that. I, I would say that our uh, teacher vacancies are slightly less than we had uh, last year, particularly um, when you take into account, um, as I said, the, some of the um, positions that are classified as teacher uh, vacancies, which in fact are um, teacher leader pathway positions that uh, in essence support expanded reach for our classroom. So slightly um, less than last year, uh, definitely took advantage of the um, ESSER funded positions, many of whom we've been able to convert um, to uh, uh, people who are on the pathway to becoming teachers. So excited to be headed in the right trajectory. We've also had a very strong hiring season with a lot of very successful um, classroom career fairs. Um, with regard to bus driver vacancies, I'll let Tim answer that. Uh, yes, we also are uh, have less less bus driver vacancies than we did last year. Um, so we have several bus drivers that are in the pipeline to be able to um, be ready to get onto the road as soon as they pass through the requirements. And so we are actually tracking better than we have been in the past. And it, I believe the exact number is 38 vacancies that we have right now. And I'll speak to the principals. So as you may or may not know that um, in terms of transfers, as a superintendent, I have the authority to transfer staff into multiple positions. So we received a resignation from Dwight Thompson, who's currently serving as the principal at Renaissance West. He's received a great promotion in another state and needed to backfill that vacancy. So um, taking a look at the 186 uh, schools that we have and the 186 principals made some changes um, to meet the needs of individual schools and also the entire district. But you didn't appoint an interim and then do a community engagement process. There's been the multiple point. times that I wouldn't do that. So it's not a great idea to open up a high school with this short amount of time, a large comprehensive high school with an interim. That just would not go well. Um, so again, um, taking a look at the needs of our district, taking a look at the needs of the individual school, and when we have a principal that's been serving, the principal that was named Paula Cook, actually was the assistant principal there, dean of students, um, had a great history, needed Orlando to go over to Renaissance West because of all the great things that have been happening there, needed him to continue that work there. Um, I had to make the decision to backfill the schools that would, would needed to be backfilled and not going through that regular process. Hello. I know a lot of people have been seeing the news about the three ring binders that you're asking kids not to bring that as well as metal backpacks. Um, this close to school, I know when my family's getting back to school stuff together, my siblings for their kids and stuff, they're all already bought them by this time. For those parents that maybe did that, are those going to be confiscated from children? Is it just going to be, please don't buy them from here on forward? What is kind of the thing you want to say to parents and if they've already gotten them, what can they do to replace those items? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll let Mr. Ivy speak a little bit, but this happened before he was actually here. Um, so last year we went through um, a process of saying, you know, when we're looking at our safety and security, sometimes with our scanners we were getting um, false positives. So students were going through, it was slowing down the process, so we did interviews, we talked to our student advisory committee, we talked to teachers, we talked to principals, we actually piloted. And so that decision was made um, last year. Schools sent out their um, request list like they typically do. Um, so in terms of parents not being aware, the vast majority of parents were aware because that was communicated by school principals before the end of the school year last year. And again, this is only for our middle and high school. The other thing that I'm really excited about as a mom with children is not having those heavy things in their book bag um, that kind of weighs them down. So it's going to increase safety, but also save the, the physical structure of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, kind of going back to teacher uh, vacancies, I was wondering, so you said 293 vacancies at this point, how many of those are EC? 
um, positions. I believe that is one moment. Hold on just a minute. We're phoning with Brian. <laughs> 56. 56. Okay, cool. And then sort of more broadly, not just those positions, but you know, with all with those vacancies, what is that gonna look like on the first day of school? Like how are you sort of mitigating the impact that might have on students who don't have, you know, a teacher in their classroom? Sure, thank you for that question. But we would never have a situation where we didn't have a qualified adult for a given um, classroom. So um, our, our schools will leverage several different options. We have um, some um, alternate staffing options where, for example, a master teacher might combine for a portion of the day two classrooms. We um, are able to often take advantage of the fact that we have one of the um, strongest national models for teacher leader pathway. So we leverage our um, incredibly um, strong master teachers and uh, extended impact teachers to provide additional classroom coverage where class sizes might be larger. Um, and then at times we might utilize um, NCVPS or um, another virtual live option um, for, for teachers. Rebecca, can I add a little bit for you? Um, so as educators here in Charlotte and across the country, we've come to grips with there will be a teacher shortage. This is not going away. Um, it probably will get worse before it gets better. So we've thought about and planned well in advance. And what we said to our team is by August 1st, every school had to have a plan that is if you weren't able to hire any more teachers, what are you going to do to make sure that there is qualified instruction for every single student? So while we continue to grapple with teacher shortages and we're doing some really creative things for the future, um, we're ready right now on day one. So thank you for that question. Yes, um, out of the 663 new teachers, I would like to know how many of those are um, teach using teaching as a second career, um, because I know you had some success with that, so I wanted to know what is the percentage of the 663 teachers, how many second career did not go into teaching, but this is their second career. And also, when it comes to academic achievement, um, I would like to know, are you doing anything new, different this year to make sure you engage um, students on day one? to close the achievement gap, and what are you doing with the curriculum to make sure that the students see themselves in the curriculum? Uh, we've gotten some calls from Hispanic students are feeling a little left out, I guess, with the Pace Academy on, off, and that. So just some Hispanic students are feeling left out and not being heard. So I want to know, have you heard that? What are you doing, and what's the plan? So. So I'm, I'm gonna run traffic control, okay? <laughs> so the first question, I don't believe we have that information in terms of the, the number of teachers that this is their second career, but we'll be happy to get that information to you. So I'll let Dr. Balknight speak to the academic facing questions that you asked. We have introduced, as I lifted up earlier, uh, lots of new resources to our classroom. We had strong professional development this summer. Also utilized some of those resources in summer camp. We are always uh, mindful of making sure that children can see them in our resources. So we're constantly updating and refreshing our resources to make sure that students are able to see themselves and have examples and books and stories to read. We're constantly also updating our media collection to make sure that they have things that they can self-select as well, whether it's in the media center or it's a, a digital book that they're able to utilize as well. And so we continue to update our resources. One of the most exciting things is that we've adopted new science resources so our families will see more hands-on labs and activities for all of our students. And about the Hispanic community. Yeah, we've, uh, I'll, I'll just answer a little bit to that. Um, we've not heard any um, major complaints from our Hispanic community. What I will say is that last spring with the help of board member Liz Monterey Duvall, we were able to host our very first um, uh, town hall with the Hispanic community and we had an amazing turnout got lots of great feedback um, most recently I've met with the Latin American coalition we're doing some really exciting things um, they've received some grant funds um, to provide um, 
both parent and student facing resources and that's going to be housed actually really close to Geringer so we're really excited there's a large number of families that will be able to take advantage of that we're also working and trying to leverage about transportation on how we can help support students not just from Geringer but from other schools to take advantage of that community resource that will be offered through the Latin American Coalition and I just want to provide clarity around PACE so we are required by federal and state um, mandates to provide a certain level of education for any student that's new to country because they're in a um, class that they have to receive specific instruction and resources. With PACE, what we were trying to do when that was approved in 2022, the goal was to pull assets together and resources together in order to serve a large number of students. So the recommendation that I brought forward was in an effort to serve a large number of students. But we will still be able to serve our students, that we will not miss a beat, um, and our students will continue to receive um, great opportunities and instruction, as well as we're really, really being intentional with the partnerships that we have um, within the community as well. Good morning. Um, Last year, there were a lot of complaints about the express busing routes. Um, did you guys determine what those problems are? Are you going to be, um, what's going to happen this year? Also, just how will the driver's vacancies affect this? I'm going to take that question because Mr. I Ivy started new and was not here last year, so I'll take that question. Um, so we, anytime you make a change, right, you're going to receive complaints. And so initially we did receive complaints because parents, especially parents that were sending their children to high school magnet programs, were accustomed to um, a door-to-door -door transportation service. So with our express stops, what we did is we attempted to shorten the bus ride and then put stops strategically throughout our community. I think the story that's not always told is in addition to that, we were also receiving a lot of complaints for students that were for attending our traditional schools because we had to have more bus drivers to accommodate both models. We had students that were experiencing double bus runs, they were getting to school late, and that wasn't just happening with our students attending magnet schools, but all across the district. So one of the things that we've tried to do is do something that's called a consolidated stop and with that, parents that are uh, participating in the express stop service are allowed to say, like they complete a form and say, we would like to recommend this stop. It's a little bit more convenient. It's closer to our house. And then we take a look to see if there are other students that maybe would be able to take advantage of that stop and create additional stops. So through that process to make it better, to your point, we've been able to add stops through the consolidated, co consolidated stop process but the other thing that we've been able to do is increase our on-time arrivals, and we've been able to decrease the number of students that are getting home in the afternoon several minutes, and sometimes in some cases several hours later than their, um, their time that they're supposed to get home. But will the vacancies that are currently happening now affect what's going to happen? No, we have less vacancies than we had last year. We have several bus drivers that are in the pipeline, and we also utilize um, any other staff that have a bus license. So it's not ideal, but our executive director, Adam Johnson, runs several stops um, if necessary until we're able to onboard. I believe that we'll be able to close the gap with our vacancies around Thanksgiving. Is that correct? That's correct. Good morning. Um, one final question. Um, so many schools were able to have Chromebooks through pandemic era funding, but that's set to run out. What is the plan as far as providing laptops or Chromebooks for students? So we were able to purchase um, technology during the pandemic with federal dollars, as you mentioned, but we did that on a purchase and not necessarily a lease. So what we have seen happen is we have a large number of assets that are essentially end of life. Um, thankfully, um, we made a recommendation to our school board, which they accepted for our budget, that would um, provide funding for one-to-one -one technology, and the Board of County Commissioners approved that budget. So we now have um, initial funding to begin getting ourselves on a lease, which would allow us to do a refresh. 
Um, so we, in January, will be sending um, laptops home with our secondary students, and we're really excited about that initiative. Thank you for that question. Hello. Speaking of ESSER funding, I know one of the big programs with that was the guest teacher program. I know you all mentioned that you were able to move some of those roles into other positions and everything. Um, can you explain a little bit about that? And then also, just because those were kind of permanent substitute teachers in the schools, what is the substitute teacher pool looking like to make sure that there's everybody in every classroom? So we had $190 million allocated in ESSER funds, and as you know, um, the vast majority of those funds were um, for people. We were able to offset those funds successfully and we were able to absorb any staff into current vacancies. So while a lot of districts experienced staff being laid off, we did not have to lay off any employees. So we're really excited about that. Um, but to answer your question more specifically about guest teachers, I would explain guest teachers as a strategy that was a Band-Aid with all of the vacancies that we've had. So while that has gone away, we still do have some long-term substitutes that are available. Um, we've worked really hard to make sure that our substitute teacher pool is strong, but we know the number one thing to impact student achievement is to have permanent teachers in the classroom. So we've really spent a lot of time as um, Ms. Brightwell talked about, investing in sourcing those teachers and training those teachers and making sure that on day one, they're classroom ready, which will allow us to retain teachers. So our, before our focus to stop the bleed was really on guest teachers, that's not necessary anymore, but we are reverting back to our old model of having long-term substitutes when needed. As far as with traffic is concerned, um, at this point, we don't have any high areas of traffic that we are seeing that would be of concern. Of course, when you run into 141,000 people, uh, 840 plus buses on the road all on one day, it is going to take um, a considerable amount of time for uh, the Charlotte Mecklenburg community to get used to all this new traffic. So what we're asking is that people just be patient. We wanna remind parents to be at their bus stops 10 minutes early. We wanna make sure that they know to leave and give themselves plenty of time and to be very vigilant about being alert because with um, drivers, there's also comes students who are walking to campus and other things like that. And our student safety is first and foremost for us. We also have student drivers who will be entering our campuses and we wanna remind them to take their time as we work through the first week of school. As far as phones, I'll have to kick that one back over. That's not something that I've been privy to. Thank you, Mr. Ivey. We do have a student code of conduct that we use here in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. We support our principals and staff as they work through our student code of conduct in that language to provide expectations for our students and families about cell phone usage. We are certainly reading and monitoring the national chatter about the cell phone usage and also what's occurring in the region, but we don't have at this time a specific rollout of a change in our cell phone practices and policies. But just to be clear with cell phones, cell phones are not to be used during instructional time. So instructional time would be time in the classroom. And so each individual principal is responsible for monitoring that. The other thing that I do wanna add with safety, with buses, if, if I may, and all of the traffic, um, if you all can also help us get the word out in terms of please reminding um, commuters is there around the city of school buses that are stopped with their arms out. We have an incredible number of citizens who make the choice to pass a stop school bus with the arm out and it is extremely, extremely dangerous. So if you can please just remind everyone to slow down and just to be aware, some people may not even be thinking, oh, it's a school bus, just getting your brain used to school buses being out over 800 of them with stopped arms and just to leave a little bit earlier, not to be in such a big rush. Uh, in terms of federal funding, I know there's been a lot of questions about that. Can you 
uh, maybe shed some light on who was to blame for the federal funding not being there for the transient kids. Um, 2023, 2024, 2025, no federal funding simply because paperwork wasn't turned in. Was that under you, and like when it had the month that you initially renamed interim and it fell, the deadline passed? Was it Hugh Hadaball when you were chief of staff or was it Ernest Winston? Like where does the collective blame come for no federal funding for those transient kids? Yeah, so um, thank you for that question, Brett. So it's McKinney Vento, and it is a sub-grant. So you have a larger grant. This was a sub-grant. Uh, the amount of the previous grant was $75,000 per year, and um, the new grant was up to $150,000 per year. So the grant was due sometime in the fall of 2022, um, and it was actually submitted in February of 2023. So when you talk about who's to blame, ultimately we're all responsible, right? Um, but as a result, you know, we had no awareness that the, that the grant had not been submitted until about this time last year when Dr. Balk Knight came on. And so what we were able to do though is leverage other federal funds um, with carryover and basically what that funding covered was largely administrative cost. So it was some professional development. It covered the cost of um, a, half of the salary of one social worker, half of the salary of an administrative assistant. We had some vacancies, so we were able to capture the lap salary from, um, not a vacancy, excuse me, a retirement. So in the grand scheme of things, just to put it in perspective, it cost about $100,000 for a teacher, right? By the time you take the average cost of a teacher, put the benefits together, it cost about $100,000. This was $75,000 a year. So while every penny counts, as it absolutely does, it was not a huge blow or a huge piece of, you know, it, it, was not a, it wasn't a huge deal. So much so that when I read the article that somebody was questioned, they were like, oh wow, I didn't even know that happened because we've been able to actually extend the services that we provide for our McKinney Vento students through a variety of restructuring that we've done as well as blended funding. Um, so to piggyback on that, so with the transient students, they will have everything they need and um, more. Okay. All right. Then. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the clear. student facing piece that was there was um, some bus, like bus passes or something like right. that for transportation. Is that correct? Right. We've been able to increase that. Previously, we did not have um, social workers assigned to every single school. We now have that on an itinerant basis. So it's not a one to one, but every school has access to a social worker. Um, as of today, all of our social workers will be trained to be able to better support our students that, ha that are in the McKinney Vento um, status, and we've been able to increase um, transportation for those students. So while it was a loss in one area, because now we have the visibility, we've actually been able to provide better services for our students. Too good. I wanted to make that clear. Um, with the EV buses, just wanted to know how would you circulate that? Would those EV buses serve just certain? Um, schools or will you is it a lottery and it'll you know you'll get it you know I just wonder how does that how do you work that um, and then also back to um, academic achievement I know when we covering CMS I know that each school like some schools had a big board and they had each student's name on there so they would know exactly what Johnny is doing so you don't have to wait until the December to find out that Johnny needed some help um, the second week of school. So I want to know what is the plan and how are you monitoring that to make sure that no student falls through the cracks? Uh, great question about the EV buses. Now, um, EV buses are a relatively a new concept and so with them comes a whole lot of different things that you have to think about that you might not have had to think about with a diesel or a propane bus. Uh, for example, charging times and when do the buses need to be charged and what do you do uh, you know, in the meantime, where do those charging stations get put up so that we can effectively utilize them throughout the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. So at this time, we're only introducing three and we're using those as a way for us to gather information, 
to look at that so how we can expand when the 55 arrive and be able to make a large scale plan of how we would be able to disperse those throughout the community. So for right now, we will be keeping those closer to their charging stations to see how they go and the routes that they'll make. And then as we um, learn more information, we'll certainly expand that and have further details by the 25, 26 school year when all 55 arrive. And, and equity and things like that, are those charging stations near, um, where are those charging stations? Are they in, what part of town are those charging stations? So going? they're currently located in one of the garages and so we're keeping them there and then um, what we'll end up doing and as they expand that, we'll utilize those at different areas around. And so, so east side, west side, south side? I am not 100% sure. Is it the Bill Wilkinson? Okay. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, eventually they will be dispersed across. I think right now they're located at the Wilkinson um, garage. But we have multiple transportation, so they would be dispersed in the different transportation garages across the county. And then I'll let um, Ms. Thompson speak to the data and then what we're doing about it. We'll flip it over to Dr. Balknight. Yep. So at the, what I would call the aggregate level or the school level, we have our new goals and guardrails. Each goal has a rate of increase for every year for the life of the goal. So for example, I've got them right here. Goal one, require, which is our K2 literacy goal, requires that every school increase by 4% every year so that at the end of five years, we're at 91%. Goal two is a 3.4% increase each year, and goal three is a 5% increase each year. Every school is developing their targets in their school improvement plan off of these annual rates of increase. So wherever the school ended last year, we need for them to increase at that rate of increase by this time next year, and the next year, and the next year. We're also planning if a school did not hit the target we projected last year as that baseline, or we're calling that year zero, we, we um, for, forecasted all of this off of a baseline of 22-23 data, then we're needing to look at that school to say, how, what do you need to do extra or more or above to be able to not just increase the 4% or the 5%, but increase the additional amount. amount. So from a school improvement plan lens, that's what's happening at, at the school level. Once we get to the individual students, we'll be starting with universal screeners, and I'll turn that over to Dr. Balknight. So I want to step back just for a moment as I lifted up earlier. We have uh, organized for endless possibilities with a restructuring of our leadership at the district level. And so our assistant superintendents, formerly learning community superintendents, now are by level. So they will be very intentional in their visits, their conversation with building level leaders, the team that they have to support them now, they actually have instructional support or coaches on their team. And so as they go into the school to work with teachers and sit in the professional learning communities where those conversations are had about individual student data, we've actually updated and provided a new platform across the district so the students utilize the platform. We could look at those things in real time, make decisions about different pathways for students, additional support for students, reach out to the family for additional needs, but to make sure that, to your point, it's not nine weeks before we make an informed decision to change direction with the student and their needs. So it'll be real time, ongoing, and very specific with our assistant superintendents by level, and they have been hired and selected by their expertise level of elementary, high, middle, or K-8. 